Okay, here we go. Uh, another one of those areas that um, kind of a, a tough area. And because um, there's a lot of um, mental health stuff associated here that uh, not so many people are familiar with. We, we're going to mention PTSD a couple times, but and everybody knows about that. That's you know, that's everyday knowledge. But some other things that aren't so necessarily widely known, and I'll touch on them as I do in all these kind of deals. You uh, you're used to it by now. Uh, so let's look quickly. Um, sexual late effects of trauma. Uh, <clears throat> particularly from um, things like childhood abuse, um, ch uh, childhood sexual abuse, CSA, is um, how it's abbreviated. And there's not a lot of research in this area, <coughs> unfortunately. Um, because of that, healing is rather difficult. The, uh, uh, the DSM, has um, classified this as a criterion A diagnosis, and it fits under PTSD, which is logical. So you've had a traumatic experience, and now you are suffering the consequences. And uh, the problem is that the DSM is not saying that... Um, this function in the sexual realm, the DSM says no, that's not a symptom of this of PTSD. So, okay, kind of confusing the confused. But um, if you look at the common symptoms of PTSD, then you can draw conclusions as to why a person who suffered some traumatic experience particularly in a sexual abuse case, might develop what's termed many times sexual concerns. You can come up with your own labels. And then the presence of flashbacks um, and nightmares all fit into this criterion. So here we, it's, I think the trouble is with the fact that it's coming from a sexual event and not something like a, a war or uh, an, anything. You pick the area. It's all, uh, it's all the same as far as the end result. You still have this traumatized, uh, would you want to call it attitude maybe, or this traumatized perception of things. Uh, so... We have we struggle with trying to to incorporate the sexual part of this into PTSD. I think that's probably pretty clear. Now, let's look at a couple of things with with CSA and, and see if we can draw our own conclusions. You draw yours, um, and I'll explain mine. The prevalence of this, the estimates are horrendous. Absolutely horrendous. There, um, the statistics indicate that one in every four females has experienced some sort of sexual abuse. My gosh, I wish I knew the percentage rate. I wish I knew the, the numbers. And uh, one in six males. Now, there's a discussion to be had here. Um Sexual trauma in women, probably more uh, highly reported than sexual trauma in men. And there's a multitude of reasons. I think your textbook, I have to go back and read it, but I think it points out that um, it, <laughs> slight interruption there, my dog. Saw another dog and was trying to say hello. The the attitude that male machoism, whatever, again, labels that you want to attach, maybe prevents some reporting of this. I think, though, it's opened up more in the, la in the last couple of three or four years. 
Um, and you can, you know, all the news reports. So, um, the um, unwillingness of, of males to report these sorts of things uh, maybe is what could possibly be skewing the numbers. Nonetheless, um, it's more prevalent even with the numbers as they are in women than men, at least the indications are that. Uh, what happens when this occurs? Now, here's where I want you to, I mentioned you draw your own perceptions and conclusions, um, but I want you to think quite a bit about this for just a second. Um, physiological changes. You're talking about a, a lot of, of disruption in the inter, excuse me, the interpretation of reaction, stress type reaction. What is the cause? Why am I having these, um, why am I having these excitatory chemicals, uh, take place. Neurological changes in the brain can take place because of uh, this sexual trauma. So what I'm getting at here is the HPA axis. I know that you guys are familiar with that. It has to do with uh, the way your body regulates its handling of stress. When you have a trauma, then there's a discussion about does this um, does this cause you to misinterpret what your body is naturally doing? Boy, you could go on and on with this for a long time. Um, the chemical reaction's the same. If you look at Hans Selye's study of of stress, you you have to separate distress from eustress. Well, your body doesn't know the difference. Your body just is, your body reacts. The, um, the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis is going to react to some, um, some, some kind of a demand made on it. Now, what you do with that is, is what you mentally or physically or both do with that is, is what the difference is. But yet here I am having this onset of an HPA axis function, and it's caused by trauma that I suffered in the past. I hope that's making sense to you. Uh, and then later on, there's the potential for disruption in areas that you might not think that it would be disrupted, cognitive, behavioral, um, but mental health in general can, can suffer the consequences of this early CSA. Uh, somatization is the kind of the term used, uh, development of physical symptoms that are in response to uh, the traumatic event. Some, sometimes it's called body memory. Uh, it can be brought on by a lot of things. And it can even cause things like, uh, but especially sexual trauma. And it can be, it can be things like chronic pains and things that are un, undiagnosable almost. So that's a weird area of this. Um, developmental effects. Yeah, it can develop mentally. It can affect you developmentally. It disrupts attachment. What attachment? My gosh. Um, Easy feisty, um, I'm sorry, attachment as in uh, secure, insecure, and then you have a couple of other subcategories. So if I, if I have suffered, if I'm securely attached, I'm trusting, and then I have some close um, relative or whatever the case is, somebody that I trust, and then they do something to me that, that they shouldn't have done, then... What is that going to do to my attachment style? The trauma is probably going to change it. Most frequently, it's thought that it changes it to a disorganized style because um, you have built this trust and all of a sudden, in the wink of an eye, it's destroyed. And 
people aren't too sure, children aren't too sure how to deal with that. Later on, you become isolated. People tend to to uh, be impulsive. They they disengage from from social events. Period. They become inhibited all because of this one event. Um, sometimes they become submissive in certain areas, and they can even become um, aggressive. So whatever you decide as an individual helps you cope with what's happened to you is generally what's going to color uh, your personality and the way you handle this stuff. If you are another category, late effects of sexual child that's what I just described to you is developmental, which obviously occurs early. Late effects may um, affect your desire for sexual activity. Um, there may be, whether founded or unfounded, complaints about sexual activity, finding fault with your, your partner, low desire, the difficulty in becoming aroused, um, etc. The most frequently reported uh, among women is a lack of desire and arousal dysfunction. I'm sorry about the movement of my camera, I'm trying to keep my dog calm. <laughs> um, there are fewer studies related to men in this area than women. And um, again, that is the result of our culture and some other cultures as well, and as far as men not supposedly being as emotional as women, which we all know is a myth. Men, women, men's and women's emotions are the same. It's just that in our culture uh, and in some others like ours, women are more likely to show emotion than men are. So this contributes to this underreported business and not having a lot of information pertaining to men and their reaction to CSA. Um, they, they even may go so far as to think they're weak or passive uh, when in actuality they aren't. Uh, I know a personal case where a young man was a young, uh, uh, he was a child at the time, lived next door to uh, this family. And this young fellow was uh, very athletic, a very good athlete. And you've probably heard these stories before. He uh, played baseball, played basketball. I'm not too sure he was a football player. And nonetheless, the point is, very athletic, very, quote, macho, if you want to call it that. Um, and when he was eight, his next door neighbor um, abused him. And for many years, he was tra he was traumatized, obviously. And for many years, he shut down the shut down the sports. And for many years, he uh, it wasn't very approachable. Eventually, uh, for whatever the reasons are, he joined the army maybe thinking that that would be some sort of a, a um, uh, way to cure what he had gone through and wound up going AWOL uh, for claimed reasons. I, I personally think that it had to do with his early experience because it confused him. It messed his development up as well. So all this is uh, real-life stuff. Um so, we're still in somewhat in the realm of PTSD related to this. I'm not trying to uh, backtrack, but the incidents of flashbacks, nightmares, and, and uh, hypervigilance, etc. that takes place can cause many, many problems uh, initiated by the sexual abuse. And then um, something that's not very often understood but happens is confusion about sexual orientation. I don't think the young man I told you about had that problem or, or had that thing come up, but um, 
Nonetheless, that can be one of the offshoots of this. Now, this is becoming a longer lecture than I want it to, so let me just basically um, point out treatment and what treatments you might want to think about using were you to become involved in this as a counselor. Um, people who go who seek treatment are very reluctant to give up defenses. They've established those over time in order to deal with this thing. So you would have to open that door. You're going to have to sit down and talk like at any any counseling session, any psychoanalytic session, uh, and I've mentioned this in, in past lectures, that you have to be able to have them be honest. I can't treat you if I don't know what it is I'm supposed to be treating uh, is the idea. So, um, and it becomes a little bit more difficult when, if you are a counselor who has undergone this yourself. So they're, they're called wounded healers. Uh, they have to separate their experience out and focus in on their client's experience with this. Um, the first step, the first steps are like any other counseling. You, uh, you have to get those doors open. You have to establish trust. You have to make sure that there are no conflicts between you and the client, etc. And then probably the next step you would want to do would be to establish um, a history of their psychology, uh, their mental health, and their sexual history. So all of these things are the first baby steps into a treatment regimen. Um, one last thing I want to point out. I'm going to leave a few things out, sorry. But I, I bring this up. Uh, probably this is biased because I'm a veteran. But the incidence now of what's called military sexual trauma, and primarily with females, um, uh, it's a it's a rising issue. It's gaining steam, unfortunately, and uh, there are things in place now. They're in the basics of trying to handle this. The VA is heavily involved in this. The estimates of women in the military service who have suffered MST, military uh, sexual trauma, is about one in four. Whew. Again, big figures. Understand that there are more females going into the military than there were in the past. Um, it was a rather odd thing when I was in back in the 60s, and then I went back in the 80s, in the 60s, uh, females were few and far between. And in my job, there weren't any females at all. I was in a combat role. And um, when I went back in the Marine Corps in 85, uh, there were quite a few women. We still didn't have any women in our unit that were combat uh, so, uh, Marines. But nonetheless, they were there. So more women, more opportunities uh, for this to happen. And uh, the military is designing ways to try to deal with this. And I hope they're successful. And uh, I think lastly, I thought that would be last, but, but there is one thing that I do need to tell you about. And again, you can read about it. The new, uh, two new areas of, of therapy one is called eye movement desensitization, desensitization uh, in reprocessing. I'm not going to tell you how that works. You can read about it. And the other is somatic experiencing. These are relatively new methods of treatment. Um, I don't know that there's much controversy with them yet, but it's pretty interesting to see how those things work. So read about those if you don't mind. Again, I apologize for my camera bouncing around them trying to keep my dog calm. And uh, so there you are. I'll be back with you in a few days with the final lecture for, for this week. Take it easy.